up, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecrack Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! That is right, and so I guess it's awards season. It's awards season, so why not get your favorite 90s-looking video game characters, me, Raymond, and Michael. Do you not remember that? Did you not see that thread on Twitter that got a little bit... Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, someone I, I took a, we had it. a screenshot of us and someone basically said, wow, all three of them look the same for one, but two, all three of them look like uh, characters out of a 1990s video game. So uh, I think, OK, I think I remember something. We, we are also strong candidates, each of us, for like the default create a player on NBA 2K or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, or, the player uh, that or has nothing or or whatever. interesting, just a blank canvas for anything <laughs> to happen upon. Three, and God was just three like, Land fellows <laughs> here to talk yeah. about All more right, interesting so, people for an hour. <laughs> so let's take our blankness and see if we can pull some amazing stuff out of the best picture winner at this past weekend's Oscars, Nomadland. Uh, it is directed by Chloe Zhao. Am I saying the last name correctly? Yes. Yeah. Um, and also was written, edited, and produced. By Chloe, starring Francis McDormand, David Strathern, and a host of quote-unquote real people, whatever that means. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. So uh, let's go around and let's get everybody's first impressions on watching this. If you've seen it multiple times, what was it like on a repeated viewing? Uh, Let's start with Michael, since Michael is kind of joining us, uh, sort of guest guest yeah. hosting with us i like yeah. this so when, let's when get the guest is in your house you, you yeah. pour their drink first so um yeah yeah so yeah um i re-watched it to be honest at one and a half speed today after watching it the weekend <laughs> it came out um i've been through like some cycles with this movie in terms of liking it when it first came out letting my brain get tricked by some of the online criticisms and responses i'm i'm back mm. at a point where i think it's a a very good movie Um, Mm. I think that when viewed as a very specific story that exists in a very specific world, um, I I, I think it's good. I think the performances are pretty phenomenal. Uh, Frances McDormand, obviously, I think one of the only two women to ever win um, three Best Actress Awards at the Academy Awards, which puts her in in very rarefied air. Uh, Catherine Hepburn being the other. Um, so like pretty good company, although her speeches are better than Catherine Hepburn because Catherine Hepburn never <laughs> howled or made crazy analogies. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, I, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good movie. And I think my favorite part of it and, and favorite might be a, a weird way to say this. Um, I think it explores the real effects of economic despair in a way a lot of films don't and and mm. gets at what it looks like to be to be poor and struggling in America in a way that is going to sound counterintuitive. I know that's like a romantic movie, but I think it doesn't romanticize poverty as much as it might seem like it does. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the inclusion of actual characters and stories helps there. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty in on this movie. Okay. You said pretty good and then very good. And then you also said you got a little bit thrown off by the online criticism. So let's keep that in our mind because I'd love to, I'd love to come back and explore kind of like what's, What's been the yeah, fur but, online that is kind of like causing these, these yeah. tensions? And I'm a conflicted man and you felt it. So, <laughs> uh. Okay, Raymond, what about you, brother? Um, I'm a huge fan of Chloe Zhao. Uh, she's one of my favorite filmmakers. I, I think The Writer is one of the best movies of the past decade. Um, it's phenomenal. So I, I was looking forward to, uh, to Nomadland just because she's involved with it. And um, I, I enjoyed it. I think I kind of got what I had expected. Um, she always works in this sort of, I don't know if, if you want to call it docudrama sort of a, approach or aesthetic, but uh, she mm-hmm. she typically will build a story around uh, real folks, real people she meets, and uh, she works with them to kind of build a narrative or, uh, around their lives and their, you know, their, their own objectives and motivations. Um, I didn't think this was... Her best movie, I would actually say it's probably my least favorite of her films, but I still really enjoyed it. I uh, I thought it was it was solid. Francis McDormand is good. Uh, I I always liked it, seeing uh, David Strathairn on screen as well. Um, and like I said, I'm I'm always on board for a Chloe Zhao movie. Um, it's nice to see her getting the recognition that I think she deserves, and I hope that 
even though she's going on and doing like uh, she's got a Marvel movie coming out, The Eternals. Uh, she's stepping in to do a new adaptation of Dracula, I think, with Blumhouse. And so she's going to be doing a little bit more uh, maybe accessible is the word uh, movies going forward. But I, I hope she keeps a foot in this world, uh, which I, I think this actually was done after she finished The Eternals. So it it seems like that's the the way her career is trending. I, I couldn't be happier for her uh, with uh, the, the, the armful of awards she's taken home and uh, hmm. looking forward to seeing what she does next. But as far as this movie is concerned, I, I think people are having some interesting conversations around it. And uh, I'm eager to talk with you gentlemen as well. Cool. Yeah, I I was I was very moved by this. I mean, I don't know if you had the same experience with seeing it in a theater, but I got to see it in this really kind of like old school. Oh, like our cool. theaters back open there yet? Are theaters open there yet? Yeah. At limited yet. capacity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't. I haven't. I, gone I saw it. Yeah. I saw it in this really like small, old, intimate theater called the Hayden Hayden Orpheum Palace in um, like North Sydney. And it's this like fucking theater out of like the the 40s or something like that. And it really kind of had this really nice, intimate event kind of experience, which was weird because it's not like an event kind of film. But it was also, um, I don't know, there was something about the space that that kind of really like brought everybody together. And it made me feel like we were all on a journey together, like we were all participating um, in in uh, a journey of feeling dispossessed and trying to find a home um, and finding community. And in a really maybe kind of like cheesy romantic sense, I felt maybe sentimental sense, I, I felt that that we were all in it together in the theater. So it was really lovely. Um, the film has stuck with me. I mean, I just saw it last night. And so it's, you know, it, has, it hasn't even, I mean, it's been 12 hours, I guess, since I walked out of the theater. And um, I actually think that this is a brilliant film. And I don't think it's a perfect film. No film is a perfect film. I think that we can explore some of the potentially problematic glamorizations um, of certain aspects of capitalism and the Amazon warehouse that I've heard people talking about. But I think we should also really kind of explore the beauty of trying to connect and find home and trying to put the pieces back together. And there are some lovely allusions to westerns to um, Ophelia there's lovely musings on poetry and so there's also something really interesting about this being a very powerful feminist film that this is a feminist maybe revisionist retelling of um, a pioneering uh, expansion into the wild but without it being like that Reese Witherspoon type where you're going out there to to like sentimentally find yourself or eat pray love it's it's something a little bit more earthen and beautifully tragic. And so I think there's so much here. Um, and then at the same time, the last thing I'll say now, just because I want to keep this in mind for us, is I do also, though, I find this to be a very Malick-esque type of film. Yeah. And so I did mm. find it a little bit derivative at times, but without the kind of transcendent romanticism that you get with Malick, with much more of an earthy, human, human take on things. But I think the cinematography, we can talk a little bit about some of those illusions later that are fucking dead on, like that's a Malick shot. Um, And so we can talk about that after the synopsis. But I do want to just give a sort of like brief uh, reading of the uh, synopsis. And so here's a little recap on what it is for those of you who either haven't seen it or just need a refresher. So after Fern loses her husband, job, and home when the town of Empire entirely runs down, she sells everything, buys a van, and takes up the life of a nomad. She takes seasonal work at Amazon and elsewhere in order to survive, uh, refusing to start her early retirement. A friend and co-worker invites her to join a support group of nomads in the desert. After being reluctant at first, Fern goes and finds a community among these other nomads who are there for various reasons, healing, adventure, freedom, connection with nature, etc. There she learns the skills of survival and self-sufficiency, like repairing a flat tire and how to poop in your van. Um, She bonds with a nomad named Swanky, who confides that she only has a few months to live. Uh, They end up parting ways, and Fern takes a job as a camp host at Badlands National Park. Maybe also another nod to Malik there. Badlands, Badlands, Badlands. Okay. Um, While she's there, she connects with another nomad, David, whom she'd previously met in the desert. He ends up falling ill, and she helps take care of him while in the hospital. And after their time there is up, he suggests that they go work together at Waldrug, 
While working at Waldrug, David's son shows up and tells David that he's going to be a grandpa and invites David to come stay with them. David then invites Fern, who replies that maybe she'll come visit sometime. When Fern's van breaks down, she's forced to ask her sister for a loan. And then when picking up the money for the van repairs, her sister invites her to stay with her and her husband. But... Fern realizes that the life of the suburbs is just simply not for her, so she again hits the road. She later learns that Swanky has died and attends a nomad memorial service. While there, Fern opens up to Bob, the group leader, about her relationship with her late husband. Bob then recalls his experience of losing his son to suicide. And then he shares his idea that goodbyes are never final, but instead he prefers to always say, see you down the road. The film closes with Fern returning to Empire to dispose of all her storage goods. She walks through her old home and in a very not so subtle nod to the searchers, I thought, she stands in the doorway looking out into the wild and then moves out towards the mountains into the undomesticated horizon. All right, so before we get into kind of pulling this film apart, we want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Skillshare. So you've heard us talk a lot about Skillshare. Skillshare is really rad. It's an online learning community where you can connect with other like-minded people and creatives and where you can explore projects that you're passionate about. Uh, it's kind of like, you could say, an online community for digital nomads in a world of late capitalism. <laughs> and this is why Skillshare is so cool, because you can unleash your creativity and pursue passions right from the convenience of your own home. And they offer thousands of creative classes for creative and curious people on topics like iPhone photography, drone filming, editing, classes on improving productivity, videos for IG, which is something I just am terrible at. So these are this is a class that actually was really helpful for me. Um, artivism, which is really interesting. What is the relationship between being an artist and being an activist? Is there a relationship? How can we kind of stimulate both sides of that by doing good art, but also being rooted in social concerns, justice concerns? And there are plenty and plenty of other um, classes and resources that you can get involved in and that you can glean from. So to explore your creativity and connect with some cool people, go to Skillshare.com slash SMTM and you get a free trial of their premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash SMTM. All right. So first, let's let's return to something that Michael said. Okay. So you said you first saw it and you thought it was great. And then you got a little bit distracted by some online criticisms. Can you, can you kind of explain what you mean? Yeah. So I saw it. Um, this is what I normally do. I see a movie and I just like it. I love being in, in theaters. And I saw this at home, <laughs> but it was like an event movie. So I was like, no devices, turning the lights off. Get yeah. the TV right. Like, I really made it an experience. F fucking moved by it. Loved it. Yeah. I go online a couple days later, and cranky cool people are like, wow, Chloe Zhao made a commercial for Amazon. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like, that type of thing. And then my brain is like, oh, yeah. I want to be smart and cranky like these people. Mm. So, so maybe there's something to that. Um, then I swung back to, what do these people want? Did they want a moment mm. where I think Linda May or whatever turns around and says, but actually Amazon is bad because of the exploitation of workers and Bezos is increasing wealth even under a pandemic. Like, I, I think I, yeah. I swung back around to this point where I think people wanted something more than it was. And maybe this is me being a little bit, um, you know, uh, too sympathetic, but sometimes and I forget their name, but there's a, someone who writes movie reviews for the magazine Jacobin. And whenever I read them, and it's like a socialist magazine. Whenever I read the reviews, I'm just like, what did you want? Did you want a yeah. part of this movie where a character looked to the camera and said, let me tell you about the means of production or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> so so all, all that to say is, I think yeah. coming back around to the film, some of the commentary, for sure. There's some problematic elements here and there. I know the original book it's based on um, got into the fact that there is a lot of racism and, and other not good things within that nomad community. That is true. But I think Chloe Zhao told a very specific and particular story that was trying right. to get us to, to feel some stuff and and not mm. making a necessarily political commentary. So that's what I've swung back to. But that is the the stuff I heard online that made me hesitate and feel like it was bad that I liked it. Yeah, the, mm. the book gets into aspects of uh, van dwelling or, or the nomadic lifestyle, however you want to describe it. Um, and they talk about how uh, there, there is one chapter I, I, I read it this weekend, and I, the one thing that did jump out to me because I've seen some of the similar discourse online, Michael, is uh, 
not only that they they explicitly bring up the the fact that uh, a large subset of the the Van Duelen community is is white uh, and they are either retirees or quickly approaching that age, um, and they sort of the the writer Jessica Bruder um, who does a very good job with it I think uh, she she talks about how in her own sort of theorizing she thinks that may just be because. Uh, black people are uh, much more commonly uh, going to be harassed and assaulted by police officers, strangers, that uh, a black person in a van doesn't have uh, nearly as easy a time blending in as uh, as white folks do, uh, and that it, it kind of just ends up sort of uh, becoming a self-sustaining loop on top of that because uh, as these communities become increasingly white and they're also largely older, Old folks typically have, or at least there is the cliche of older folks having a, a, a retrograde sort of cultural uh, uh, ideas or notions about other people. And mm. there, there is just a kind of an Ouroboros effect that she sort of describes in the book a little bit. And uh, to, to her credit that I think the movie, you know, like you said, what do you want them to do? Uh, like turn to the camera while they're in an actual Amazon, you know, fulfillment center, warehouse, whatever you want to call it, and say like, uh, we we know this company's terrible. And uh, the the book is much more explicit about the uh, the abuses that they endure uh, under Amazon. But also, there's this weird kind of psychological thing that they talk about with the the work camper workforce that because they are largely older folks, they they it, it's i i want to tread lightly here because i'm not trying to denigrate any <laughs> any specific mm -hmm. demographics but the book kind of implies that because they were a generation that was raised to believe in you know oh you should just fucking grind mm -hmm. yourself down to the bone for your boss and and you you should like you're not supposed to enjoy work and that's the the heart mm -hmm. of good old fashioned american work ethic is that uh you you go somewhere else and and work tirelessly to make them more money for fucking 12 hours 14 hours doesn't matter and they they talk about how you can like there are dispensers for generic painkillers all over the fulfillment centers where you can just you're encouraged to just like pop two at the beginning of your shift and take two on the way home. Uh, if you want the like good shit, the Tylenol or the Aleve, you actually have to pay for that. Like they get into aspects of it that are really, really disgusting, mm -hmm. but they, they talk about once again, how that becomes kind of a, a self-sustaining workforce that they're this, this is a generation for whatever reason, they single them out and they say in like the Amazon working materials that they that they send out in pamphlets and, and all of their bullshit that like we love older folks because you you know you don't talk back and you this <laughs> that and you're willing to uh, eat as much shit as we'll shovel down your throats and it there there is some of that that I, I wish uh, made its way in, into the movie but it's also very tough to circle that square of like how can we uh, uh, depict this world as authentically as possible, which means within actual Amazon uh, warehouses, yeah. because Amazon is a huge player in the book, and it would kind of, if you're going to call this thing Nomadland, I could see if you just made a generic movie about these these types of folks, uh, then maybe you could dodge that altogether, but it, it's such an important part in the book, it, it seems like they, they maybe had to make some compromises to... Um, to, to make that happen on the uh, on the screen. Yeah, and so I think it's also interesting too, this is just a little bit of kind of like art theory here or film theory here, but there's a difference between making representational art and what I would call expressive art. And it sounds like that if you're gonna be critical of this and you're gonna say, man, I wish that they would have had a wink, wink, nod, nod to the audience and be like, just so you know, there's hyper exploitation happening here, da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. Bezos is an asshole. Well, then what you get is you get a sort of like, step back a step removed from the actual immersion of the story whereas rather what we get is a really sort of immersive experience of following this one person yeah. and the fact that she doesn't have quote unquote class consciousness raised about her exploitative position is actually to me very powerful because so many people in the world i would say a lot of people a vast majority of people in the world can kind of empathize with her and be like, you know what? I do like work. Now, I wish my working conditions were better. Like, sure, 
I wish I had more time to spend with family, with friends, um, connecting with nature, you know, um, enjoying um, uh, the birth of my child or something like that, which is something that you get with David Strathern's sort of like turn at the end where he decides to to move in with his son and be a, a homey grandpa, which he never was before. And, Tim and so I think down, that yeah. that's right. Yeah, and I, th I personally think that that the reason this film is so powerful is because it still allows us to have this conversation and to be aware of, oh, well, maybe she's not aware of the fucking critique of political economy and how uh, the, the, the value form abstractly encloses our consciousness. Da -da 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 -da. It's like sometimes you got to just stop and be with real people. And one of the things I love about this film is it is so human. These are people. If this were Terrence Malick, you would get some sort of poetic utterances about like metaphysics. If this were some sort of, uh, I don't know, I, Oliver Stone or something like that, you would get some sort of like intentional, like uh, here are the bad guys or Scorsese. You would get a more of a move that is like, I'm removed from this and I'm showing you. But this was such an immersive experience that I think that makes it more powerful because it brings you into that world. And to me, that is so valuable as a narrative device is to be brought into a world to see the world from an angle that I'm not familiar with. I have a little bit of the nomad spirit within me, and I've romanticized it in my own mind. And so seeing this, one, was very romantic, but also tragic and heartbreaking. The moment when she's standing at the water and those waves are crashing, I didn't have a, oh my God, nature is just so loving and it's just all universal love. I was like, holy fuck, man, the world is violent and the seas and are stormy and nature is chaos in so much, which is also a wonderful thing, right? So for me to kind of live in this weird complex place where I'm just sitting there and letting this film wash over me, rather than trying to kind of rush to a critical assessment, I think yeah. that's what I think that's what makes really good art. And that's why yeah. I, I think this film has really stuck with me. I mean, it's only been 12 hours, but I feel like it will stick with me because of the the strength of the emotions and thought yeah. that I'm experiencing after after watching it. And I think it is critical to to our reading of the film to note that the the main character in this movie is essentially representing those demographics that are highlighted in the book. Yeah. Um and I think it's interesting, Austin, like you brought brought up the nature scene. I think nature is used really interesting in the film. And I think it's, you know, it's telling. Obviously, it's based on real stuff, but it could only take place in the West um, because the, <laughs> the West of the United States has both some of the most stunning, gorgeous, calming, beautiful, natural settings in the country. And it also has some of the gnarliest, scariest, most dangerous places, right? These deserts mm -hmm. where we see them, like, are, are beautiful, gorgeous places. They can also get to be 130 degrees and, like, you, you fucking yeah. sweat to death in your car. Um, you know, same with, the, <laughs> with the Pacific Ocean, it's beautiful, yeah. but it can also get very gnarly. Um, and I yeah. think the use of nature was great because I feel like it juxtaposed the the overwhelming natural beauty of a country against the overwhelming horrors of the the economy and and sort of mm. like labor in that same place, and and gives both of those to us at the same time without really apologizing for either. And I found that really interesting like these people are in these gorgeous places but they're driven there because they couldn't make enough of a living and i think um and i might be saying her name wrong i'm very sorry i think it's linda may or something may is one of the first friends she makes um i know she, she when we meet her she seems happy but she tells the story about how she entered this lifestyle because in 2008 after the financial crisis she was going to drink a That's bottle right. of booze turn on the propane and and fucking die and kill some dogs as well that would have been brutal we love dogs um yeah. but i think you know, it's telling that like she's living this cool life now and she's building her eco home. Well, how did she get there, though? By almost fucking mm. killing herself because yeah. she w tried to get Social Security and after working for 60 years had five hundred dollars. Yeah. You, you brought up uh, Terrence Malick, Austin. I don't know if you've ever seen yep. To the Wonder with uh, Ben Affleck. Um, that to me is I, I know a lot of folks think of that as one of his lesser films, and I I, I tend to agree but I think he's doing oh, something Oh, I like everything he does. Just yeah, pump, no, same pump here. Malik, but, pump, pump him into my veins. <laughs> one of the things I really like about To the Wonder that makes it stand apart from a lot of his other movies is that it's not, it's not set in the past. It's not a period piece. And mm. what you were saying, uh, Michael, about uh, juxtaposing 
that nature against the the, the ravages of a, a modern economic system. There, I always think of this one shot into the wonder where he's like photographing a sonic drive through the way that he would a waterfall. Uh -huh. And mm. uh, Austin, you, you say that, you know, Chloe Zhao's style may be a little bit derivative, um, but I, I think that sort of like poetic realism or whatever you want to call it, it's yes. been so often imitated. Uh, it's very rarely duplicated. And I, I think she does, to, to Michael's point, I think she does pull something off aesthetically with this that, that very few filmmakers can. This, this does feel like um, not just a, 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 a wonderful work of art, but also a, a great document of the times. Yeah, and let's let's linger over this Malik bit a little bit too. So for people who are listening who aren't as familiar with Terrence Malik, um, he's known for being a very sort of by some people inaccessible filmmaker in the sense that um, even actors have criticized him and that he's worked with right and um, a lot of critics. They haven't loved his more recent, like explicitly poetic works. And they sort of miss when he was a little bit more narrative based with kind of poetic flourishes. But the last few works have been quite heavy handed Strictly in their poetry. Although, kind of although poems, Hidden yeah. Life, yeah, although Hidden Life, I think, brought back the narrative, the narrative elements quite well. But but um, the thing that's so interesting about this is there are a couple shots that I was like, oh, my God, that's 100 percent like a Malik shot. So he, uh, Chloe did the thing, like Malik is known for like, you'll, you'll be on somebody's face and then that person will be talking about some sort of like poetically beautiful metaphysical thing, whatever. And then the camera will just pan towards like birds flying in the sky or like, or like a sunset or like clouds or like the, the sun shining through leaves or something like that. And you saw a lot of that here, uh, focusing on a bird at one point. And then there's that whole like, uh, camera uh, that she's given where she's looking on her phone where like her friend sends the video of the birds which is a sort of like um, lesser high quality version of it but still it's the same kind of idea yeah. you get like the the climbing up looking at the redwood trees but my favorite one that was so clearly Malik was the hand inside the hand the baby hand at the end inside uh, David Strathern's hand, sure. which is like a shot for shot replica of Tree of Life, one of the really yeah. famous shots in Tree of Life. Isn't it a foot? But here's what's interesting. What's up? I thought it was a baby's foot in Tree of Life. I don't know why I'm. Isn't maybe, there I'm mis maybe I'm misremembering that, but I uh, I feel like the iconic image was a baby's foot, but I'm 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 sure I'm okay. wrong. No, it, it could. It, I think I think I remember both, but maybe I'm wrong here yeah, too. Who but, knows? Sorry, but sorry. I, st to I still. It. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that the, the thing that's interesting, though, is what what Zhao does, though, is she still does all of that, but she reinterprets it, one, in the story of a sort of like feminine heroine, which Malik never does. Malik's stories are very sort of dude driven, right, from his war films to even something like To the Wonder, Knight of Cups, Hidden Life, etc. Right. So there's something interesting there. But again, it's it's you use the word. Um, like poetic realism. And I actually wrote down in my, my notes that poetry is a constant theme. She was a tutor and she quotes mm -hmm. poetry, right? And she asks one of her former students at one time, like, do you remember anything I taught you? And then she meets that one young boy that she's like, oh, he's kind of lost. And, um, you know, she kind of uses poetry as a bridge, as a way to connect, inspire, give him some sort of beauty because of his own like longing and his romantic love for this girl that he has back home or whatever. So there's something interesting about how poetry is used, but it isn't used to detach, right? It isn't used to talk about the heavens, the universe, the history of reality, um, transcending up to God or something like that. It's, it's a way of connecting with human beings because in this sense, like poetry is an expression of the human experience. And this whole film is just so much an expression of the human experience. And that's why I think even though we could say it's quote unquote derivative, um, I think it's actually really constructive in what it does by sort of recycling these tropes. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, so here's another thing that I was thinking about. Um, so I talked a little bit about how I, I think that there's some nods to like that one shot, the searchers shot. And if you, if people who are listening who aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, there's a famous shot at the end of the searchers where John Wayne is invited into a home 
You know, he's the man of the wild. He's the man of wilderness, the man of violence. He's invited into the home and there's a shot from inside the home and it's really shadowy inside. And then he's standing outside and it's this beautiful silhouette, right? Of kind of him realizing that that he can't come into the domesticated world even though he helped build that world he belongs to the wild right and so he can't come in the home he turns around and he goes off back into the wild and i think you get something really beautiful here at mm. the end she sort of comes back to her house after having this journey that we've followed her on and she looks at this thing that she was still holding on to she had her stuff in storage she still was holding on to the past. She couldn't move on. Like, are we meant to think that does she go and start a relationship with this guy, David, who was clearly romantically into her? Does she kind of just go and give her life to the road? I don't really know. But the point is, is that she's letting go of what she previously understood as domestic home or something that was hers, that was her possession. And she stands and she faces the horizon, which is the wilderness, and she goes out into it, which I thought was a really kind of lovely and touching way to take a Western theme about like the person of the wilderness, um, but interpret it in a very sort of like contemporary framework. So I, I don't know, did that, did you notice any of that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I think uh, it, it effectively kind of communicates the same thing that I, I, I think um, uh, John Ford was going for with the searchers, that this is a person who has essentially sort of been left behind. Um, and this is a, a recurring theme in the book that they state uh, quite frequently, that whether or not these folks have chosen these circumstances, most of them have chosen to embrace it in a way. Um, and, mm -hmm. and there is that that sort of uh, i think reckoning for her by the end of this that i i can't recall because i i watched this when it came out on hulu but i didn't rewatch it for the podcast so I, maybe i'm not doing my due diligence but do they state at any point what what happened to fern or what why she started uh van dwelling to begin with was that is that something they ever get into or is it just kind of implied that you know, she got caught up in a lot of the same uh, same issues as these other folks. I can't. Yeah, I, I think it's implied and then explained that like literally the whole town shut down and she had nowhere to go. And there is oh, the okay. one scene where she's at like the unemployment office or something like that, and the woman That's says to her right. like, "Times are hard. You could take early retirement, but there's like no jobs." So I don't know. And, and also, you might have read this right. differently, but I got the sense that th this was a, a matter of circumstance in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's that's what I took it. I mean, I took it as because you get the little title card at the beginning that tells you about what happened to the town of Empire. You yeah. know that her they lost yeah. the job. Then she loses her husband, and so I thought it was okay. The town is shut down. She's forced into this. But remember the scene when she's with her sister back in the house, and the sister invites her and says, "Oh, you can come and live here, right?" And then there's also that other woman that's in like the sporting goods store that's like, "Oh, you can come and stay with yeah. us." There are always these offers for her to come to a new type of domestic life. But her sister reminds her at one point, you were always like this. You left and when you met Bo, your husband, you moved away and you stayed out there. So even in the town of Empire, it was their own form of domestic life, but it wasn't in the thick of the suburbs, right? It was still, still a, a, yeah, and it, and it was still a choice, a choice to not, a, a choice of refusal. And you know what's interesting? It really hit me hard. It, this is such a, not a low stakes film, but it isn't like an over dramatic film, right? Like the things that really made me go <gasps> are one, when David Strathern's character drops the plates and you're just like, oh my God, like that is her world that those plates. Okay. So that was one when she's sick and she has to go to the bathroom on the, in, on, on the, the thing. You're like, oh fuck, I guess you don't realize how close your crap is to the bed and how tiny everything is. Um, and then, uh, when she obviously get her car breaks down, that's just like tragic. Right. Um, and so there are these really kind of like these super potent moments, but they're kind of like everyday things. If you're like, you know, like middle-class and relatively wealthy, you're like, oh, I broke some plates. Okay. It's not that big of a deal. Or, oh, the car's broken. It's 2,200 bucks. Sure. I can fix that. Whatever. Right. But for her, these things really friggin' matter. And because the yeah. film is so sedated throughout, those things hit like a lightning rod, but she's sitting there and the sister offers her 
to stay. But remember, just before that, they're all sitting in the backyard. And this was the scene that really got me. And I just felt so grossed out by these dudes talking about asset prices and investment and portfolio management because we just felt the real, so to speak, quote unquote, right? We just felt her connected with nature and with people and humans and the, the music and, and like the tears and cancer diagnoses. And then all of a sudden you get these guys in like fancy fancy clothes that are sitting in their comfy backyards and they're talking about asset price inflation. And you're like, wait a second here. Like this yeah. is just a total well, juxtaposition of worlds. And I think it's important that like in that scene, the brother-in-law, maybe one of his buddies brings up 2008. Now at the beginning of the film, we yes. hear about 2008 leading one character to almost killing herself. Um, yeah. This dude's like, oh, if only in 2008, we would have bought more houses. It seems like it's always going up. Yeah. And I think that's Ugh. another thing. Like from different perspectives, the same economic moment leads one person to trying to like get shit faced and gas themselves to death and another person to seeing some great business opportunities. And it's interesting yeah. to see Fern go back to her family after having that experience. And I think it is striking because I. I think many people are, are privy to conversations sometimes about that. Um, I'm personally not a real estate tycoon, maybe one day, but without realizing <laughs> that all of those things are built on real people and real stuff. And I, and I like that the movie makes us confront that a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Raymond, did you want to jump in there with anything or? Oh, um, I mean, I think that's it. It just brought to mind, uh, there was a viral tweet a while back. Someone said something to the effect of like, so a single cell organism crawled out of the ocean and now I have to work 40 hours a week. Like it's just, oh. it is, it is kind of one of those things where when, especially when you are on this journey with them that you, you get this sense that like this kind of just is the world to them. They're essentially cut off from all of that stuff or effectively, you know, uh, practically they are. And to have that sort of like, collision back with you know what is deemed polite society um and just hearing people like quibble about what is effectively just made up bullshit that's all stored on a, a bank of computers somewhere is yeah just, it, yeah it is it is bizarre to, to to think about that sort of like reassimilation process uh in a way um yeah. that i think in some ways makes it uh not just a a, a poignant film for this era in, with regards to uh its commentary on um you know late stage capitalism but also just with regards to uh the pandemic like there there is this sense of unease around other people and you know this is the kind of lifestyle that attracts uh certain types of people a lot of them may be introverts already um, but you get kind of the the hint that maybe Fern was better at this before uh, she took to the van permanently, you know? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think it's just like interesting politically, too, that and maybe this is what pissed some people off. Like these people aren't trying to change the world. Uh, they have some circumstances. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I think a movie, if it's like 20 or 30 year olds, it's like this is exploitative. What are we going to do? Let's band together. And I think there's something about the, the the community of nomads that meet up for the the bearded dudes conferences or whatever. That's like an acceptance of reality. It's like we're not going to change the world. We don't have the power and capacity to do that. So we're going to figure out how to exist within this world without necessarily doing all the things we're supposed to do in that world. And I mean, there's something really depressing about that. And there's something kind of beautiful about it as well. So I think we've talked about it on this podcast before, but Eric Olin Wright is a really notable sociologist who passed away um, in 2019, I believe. And he famously describes what he calls four anti-capitalist orientations. And he says there's reform to try to reform capitalism is basically like what you get with Western Democrat democracies, right? The welfare state that tries to mitigate some of the effects of the excesses and things like that. So they give workers some concessions and whatnot. But capital still maintains its power. But there's this perpetual battle of of kind of mitigating the fallouts of capitalism. Then there's smash, which is like direct confrontation. Let's confront capitalism and let's destroy it. You know, revolutionary Marxism, revolutionary anarchism, stuff like that. Uh, then there's erode and erode is Eric Olin Wright's own position where he's like, OK, let's let's not smash it, but we also can still contest it. So you build like workers co-ops and we implement policies like universal basic income and things like that that will give people new forms of um, socioeconomic value and benefit, but that also contest the system of capitalism. And hopefully, ultimately, it will erode and will turn into some sort of post-capitalist 
uh, future, you know? Um, and then the one that I think actually came to my mind a lot when watching this film is what he calls escape. And it's where you want to escape capitalism. And this is the one that is sometimes, you know, you get this in anarchist communities, like building up temporary autonomous zones. You see this in like cottage core movements, like let's just go out and live in a tiny home and make our own butter and, and make our own Whoa. clothes and stuff like that. <laughs> and then and then you could also see it in this nomad life or in Australia, what's really popular here. And I'm sure it is elsewhere, too. But like I'm just really familiar with it here because I've been surrounded by it is the van life. It is freaking mm -hmm. everywhere here. It's just surfer people that are in their vans driving and living up the coast and, and stopping and and they do it for a year or two maybe for for longer it typically here from what i've seen is a middle class aesthetic yeah and it's usually um people who are generally pretty priv privileged and they're young but in this film i still i think we still saw a really lovely form of like escaping and and in that escape it was kind of also like not just a running from, but then the community that you find in the desert that Bob is leading is also trying to then recreate something. He's trying to create a new form of community. They've got their own bartering system, right? You saw that scene where they're like trading goods. There's like a bartering yeah. system. They share and they eat together in communal living spaces. They make music together. Um, obviously, you've got uh, Francis McDormand's character, Fern, who's a poet. Um, they've got like mechanics and they become self-sufficient. So there's really something kind of interesting, I think, is if we think about it from that perspective, that this film yeah. is a film of escape, but also of rebuilding a direct alternative. And it's interesting just to use the example of the van life in Australia, which I think we're, we're at least in America, I feel like on the West Coast, that's becoming more and more popular. There was a New York Times mm. piece about old nomads, like from Nomadland, beefing with contemporary new hashtag van life people. Because a lot of the uh, new van life people are like influencers who are getting paid yes. to do like advertising in their van or they're people who yes. are graphic designers or programmers who can pull up and use their Wi-Fi hotspot to you know, do high paying work for 20 hours a week and sustain themselves. And, and they've been sort of like killing the vibe and blowing up spots all around the West. Yeah. Some of these people are like, we're just trying to fucking survive and we don't care about your like, you know, sponsored tea content. So it's interesting to see uh, uh, th that confrontation take place. Well, not see it, I read about it, but. Not only yeah. that, but the, the tension that I think, in addition to some of the, you know, air quotes controversy that you were uh, describing mm -hmm. at the beginning of the show michael there's there's also some uh some folks i've i've read uh sharing some pretty thoughtful criticism about the film with regards to uh its depiction of uh, an unhoused populace um being essentially removed uh, at least by one degree of privilege with regards to you know they can afford yeah. they can afford to buy a van yeah. they, they can afford to buy you know an induction cooktop and things like that and it, it it reminds me of um and i'm grateful that the movie didn't go in this direction there's one character in the book that is kind of like a, a van dwelling guru who has some pretty uh, i think fairly pernicious stuff on his website where he talks about like uh, to, to bring it back to uh the the searchers moment for you austin he talks about the difference between like a a capital h homeless person and a van dweller as being uh, a homeless person is trying desperately to reintegrate into a society that has uh, exploited them and ultimately cast them off, which I think is uh, uh, pretty presumptuous. But um, the, it, it, he has this weird kind of almost like affirmative or aspirational or even vocational view on van dwellers that like they are mm. above the rabble that this is this is a choice mm. and only a choice and once again even if you're pushed into it by circumstance you choose to embrace it and all this shit um and there there is a, a an, an aspect of that at the end where it, it it does genuinely seem like she to maybe Chloe Zhao's credit, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is something she's consciously doing with this this script and this film, but she seems to be making the point quite clearly that like no, some some people aren't trying to reintegrate into this uh, disgusting exploitative system. Like some some people are are just they've found their peace and they've found themselves on mm. the outside of that and. Uh, hopefully with some construction around them, hopefully with some some social uh, fabric and integrity uh, built around them as well. So let's ask this. Why do we think that this film is gaining the attention that it, uh, that, garnering the attention that it's getting and gaining the momentum that it's getting today? Like, why was this film made now and why is it striking or pricking the chords of people's hearts 
now? Is there something about the contemporary moment? Is there something about this film? Is there something about Zhao's work that this was just like she was due? I mean, obviously, having Frances McDormand involved gives it a lot more of a of a forward facing um, angle. So, like, what do we think? Why now? And why did it win? Yeah, I mean, Best I think it, well, in one yeah. sense it won because a lot of their movies this year were bad. And I, and I, I wish I could say some more poetic than that, but like some of the films that were nominated would not have been nominated in a normal year and they weren't good. Some I watched, I think almost all of them, they were, most of them were fine. A couple of them were good. I think this one was like maybe a little bit better than good, but I don't know. It just did something kind of real. Like, I don't know. I think the, the two of the movies that were nominated this year that I think stand out are this and Sound of Metal because they're, they're kind of real, they're personal, they're affecting, they're not escapist. And I think there's been so much either escapist or historical film recently that either take us back to a place, we, we a moment we didn't see, so whether that's Travel to Chicago 7 or Mank, or they take us to some fantastical world. I think there's something real, and whether or not people want to admit it, maybe I'm going to sound like a hippie here, people want that real shit, man. And I, I think there is something mm. uh, affecting and real about it that, that struck people. And it doesn't hurt that Frances McDormand is is a very singular talent. And I think yeah. mixing Chloe Zhao, who yeah. knows how to make a fucking movie with Francis McDormand, who knows how to fucking act, mix those two together and something pretty good's going to happen. Yeah. But yeah. It, it is kind of funny uh, when you, when you watch her other films, like she has this incredible gift uh, that I was referring to earlier about how she can kind of extract this energy from folks, from non-actors or first time actors. And, and the way that she's able to, to build a story around what they give her and meet meet them on their terms, it is it is like a, a very largely empathetic process. Her her entire uh, creative process, and I and it's it's kind of weird to think about, especially considering I, you know, I like this movie, but like I said, I, I think it's three of three in her filmography, and I I do think maybe the big difference is that this has Francis McDormand in mm. it. Like, there, yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that may I just wondered. be, <laughs> that may just be the thing that pulls the spotlight over. I mean, obviously it is like, she's a, she's a, a big movie star, but as far as people talking about this or, or maybe this becoming like the er text for Chloe Zhao's filmography going forward, I, I, I think, yeah, you, you can't discredit the power of a movie star uh, when you turn yeah. the cameras on. One of the one of the last things I wanted to address, um, as we've only got you know a few minutes left here, we'll try and get through a couple more things if we can. I read an article by Steve Rose in the Guardian from yesterday, and the title of the article is "Nomadland: Is quote structured reality cinema an exciting new trend or simply fake news?" And I'll just I'll, I'll I saw in the little test. And the little tagline was the Oscar nominated movie, along with Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets, is the latest film to play with the truth. And I'm just going to read the final paragraph here. Um, it's a really short little article, but it says, when you think about it, Nomadland is really not a million miles from structured reality shows such as Made in Chelsea or Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Ooh. or indeed The Apprentice, whose stage-managed faux veracity helped convince the world that Donald Trump was a competent, insane human being. Maybe blurring the boundaries has consequences after all. We like a bit of truth mixed in with our fiction, but we don't want any fiction mixed into our truth. Non-binary cuts both ways. Now, here's the thing. Here's my thing. First of all, I think this is a horrible take yeah. um, on all kinds of reasons, uh, on all kinds of levels. But here's the, here's the thing that I also wonder. I think so many people, it's like they have a difficult time with dealing with the blurring of the lines because something bad happens. They look at the Trump presidency and they're like, that's bad. And then they try to find the cause for it. And then they're like, well, because he's a celebrity who was given some sort of like viability and, and public esteem, then, then anything that, that, that kind of like deals with a real world possibility and then the world of what images or media, okay, that's the bad thing. So then anything else that does something similar with the quote real, but also with the imagination is therefore bad. I mean, that's just really bad reasoning for one, but I also think it <laughs> fundamentally misunderstands what art is. Art is always, always a blurring of those lines. You do not have a documentary that is, even if it's the most perfectly researched, or I can't say perfectly because it's never gonna be perfect, Like, but the most intensely researched thing, and it's a bunch of talking head experts talking about the rotation of the earth uh, uh, around the sun. 
it still is going to have like some funky images or some metaphor or something that is going to blur those boundaries. So I just, I kind of don't understand this take and I, I just had to share it because I don't usually say, no, that's terrible because I usually <laughs> like to give people the benefit of the doubt and like explore, but I think that's a terrible take. It's a bad take. Wrote. That's just, yeah, it's it's just a bad take. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't read the rest of that article, but I, I I did read the little blurb that you excerpted for Twitter and I I knew you would bring this up. <laughs> Listen, people are trying to put content out. They got to get those clicks. Shouts to my guy at The Guardian trying to pay rent. I know uh, it's, it's expensive in London, but yeah, it's a, this is a bad take. Yeah, this is uh, just just a, a classic classic uh, uh, air airbrain thing here. Just not just completely failing to understand, like you said, what the nature of art is and how all artists draw from a synthesis of reality and and maybe the world they wish to see. Like there's there's yeah. a, a million different interpretations of art, but blurring yeah. blurring the lines between documentary and fiction will give us future despots is a pretty pretty big stretch <laughs> well mcdormand i guess she started some new party um politically that plans to like overthrow all the libtards and um install can't no she wouldn't do that she's a cool oh, person okay. <laughs> um do, wait did anyone did you all watch the oscars just out of curiosity no i i didn't i watched a couple highlights but i didn't oh, watch oh i'll just say this show. for you all for anyone who's watching this Look at the go look up the clip of when she won. It was also an interesting moment because they, they it was like best picture. Um, and, and then she won best actress right after. But they cut to her um, husband, Joel Cohen, who I guess mm-hmm. is a filmmaker um, at one point. And of some note. Yeah. yeah, I guess he made some like student films or something. I don't know. His reaction is just very funny. There's a very fun, like jiffable moment of her howling on stage to shout out um, the sound designer who worked on No My Land, who unfortunately passed away. Um, and they cut back to her husband, and I don't know. It's just a fun moment. I say everyone look that up. And also, awesome. I just I'll never get over the fact that she's a part of one of the coolest power couples in Hollywood. That is the definite truth, uh, and that they Michael, collaborated on one of the greatest films of the last what fifty years or something like that. So with Fargo, so fifty, hundred, two hundred, whatever you want to say. Yeah. <laughs> however, however long yeah. people have been making. <laughs> yeah, go movies. fucking yeah, thousands. Fargo's I'm up good. there. It's so great. Um, <laughs> Michael Michael brought up that uh, New York Times piece, Nomads versus Van Lifers, or that was the the sort of context of it. I definitely want to give that a read. And uh, before we go to the mailbag, I just wanted to throw out uh, one more interesting read that's kind of adjacent to this. There's a, a Verge article from a couple years ago called Road Tripping with the Amazon Nomads, which is mm. actually about a group of folks who go from like department store to department store to try and find things that they can... Uh, upsell on Amazon by by like taking them to Amazon fulfillment centers and so it's a really really weird sort of thing. I remember reading a, a spate of articles a while ago about folks in the Bay Area who make a, literally make a living by fishing discarded electronics out of like tech billionaires trash cans and stuff and like that's their job and it is just. It's the most late stage capitalism shit in the world. Just like all these weird (laughs) cottage industries that have popped up around this this monopolistic fucking Leviathan and and just yeah, I I would highly recommend checking some of that stuff out. That 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 uh, verge piece particularly, yeah, stuck with me. It's it's a really interesting piece of reporting. Sweet. Well, as Raymond alluded to, let's jump into the mailbag. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation, if you want to contribute to this conversation, if there's anything from our back catalog that you want to throw your two, two cents on, uh, please, you can call us at 1-213-534-8807. That's 1-213-534-8807. Or, of course, you can email us, movies at wisecrack.co. That's movies at wisecrack.co. We've got one voicemail this week that we're going to get to. It is from Matt, who wants to chat about Judas and the Black Messiah. So go ahead, Matt. Hey, hey, Wisecrack fam. My name's Matt. I'm a long-time listener. Super excited. This is my first voicemail. Actually, my first time really interacting with you guys other than commenting on the YouTube channel. But the one thing that was really, really bugging me while I'm listening to the Judas and the Black Messiah podcast, not necessarily bothered me, but just no one (laughs) brought up the fact that for Bill... I don't necessarily see another option. If you are in his position, you are a black man, and you're told to either go to jail and, you know, whatever's going to happen with the people that they put in jail back then in those times, or 
do what he did, which is become an informant and basically get himself deep into the Panther movement until that fateful evening. But you have to think of it from his perspective. If, if you were in that position, what would you do? You're not going to sell yourself out. It's survival of the fittest. And even though he was out there surviving, you can't take away any of the stuff he did for the Panther movement. That is that is what I find so fascinating about this movie, and I think that's the reason they made Bill the protagonist. It's to make you question. It's not to make you say, oh, yeah, he's definitely good. He's definitely bad. It's to make you see the gray. It's to make you see that maybe the situation isn't as easy as some people would like it to be. I know some people would probably love to throw a blanket over Bill and say, oh, he was a traitor, he's not a real brother of the Black Panthers, or whatever it might have been. But in all honesty, what else could Bill have done other than end his life right then and there? It, it's such a difficult question, but it makes you think. And, and that's the whole point of this movie and this podcast, guys, right? <laughs> Anyways, like I said, huge fan. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, sweet. So this is definitely an interesting point, right? I mean, um, you get that a little bit with, with him kind of justifying his actions at the end of the film when it goes to the real live archived footage. And uh, it certainly is. And I think we also need to, in some sense, give him the benefit of the doubt that he didn't know that he was going in to have Fred Hampton assassinated, right? Um, now, he still was a snitch, and that we can definitely condemn him for. But I think the film tries at least to give us a little bit of a, hey, he's in he's in between a rock and a hard place. And I think yeah. that's why the film tries to at least give us both sides of that. Even though the dude then kills himself after he admits that on live air, which I mean, I think is kind of a self-condemnation that he was even yeah. full of shit in his own efforts to try yeah. to justify it to himself. So I think even himself, I think he knew that he was lying. Um, but I do, I do get what the caller, I do get what Matt is saying to kind of ponder on this a little bit. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone would deny that, that he's, he's definitely stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, I think as much as we maybe touched on his motivations last week, I can't remember exactly what we might have said. But the thing that's really interesting to me, especially because even having read a bunch about him, there's still not a lot of folks who really can claim to know him. Um, hmm. uh, and... The thing that's kind of interesting to me, at least, is that I I do believe that he was sort of down with the cause for for much of that, whether whatever like landed him there in the first place. But the thing I'm most curious about is that before he met uh, Roy Mitchell when he was uh, uh, 17 years old, which is something the movie kind of glosses over that you know these guys were 17 yeah, and 21. And yeah, I get why they they cast them with the people they did because it's it's tough to find 17 and 21 year olds who can do what they're capable of doing. But you do get the sense that like maybe at that age he he was really interested in becoming an actual intelligence officer or FBI agent like maybe he saw this as a legitimate inroads to to and and you know I'm just speculating but like he he says explicitly that he looked up to Roy Mitchell and that's actually in the transcripts from the uh, the eyes on the prize interview and um uh, he was also like pretending to be an FBI agent. Like that's what got him in trouble with the police in the first place. Not exactly mm -hmm. how it's depicted in the movie, but there, there is this question for me at least that like, was there maybe a part of him that, that saw that as a means to an end that he was like that, that's uh, if, if we expressed any kind of ambivalence or, uh, or, or questioning or ambiguity with regards to uh, his motivations, at least for, uh, I can only speak for myself, but that's kind of where I may have been coming from with that is like, I, I think he did really believe in both of these causes, at least at one point in his life. Hmm. Michael? Oh, yeah, I, I agree with what y'all are saying. I think that while watching the movie, I didn't think about... Um, what the you know what the caller of the voicemail had to say i mean i think the reason i found the film compelling and why I, while i found that character's performance compelling is that you do at certain points kind of sympathize with him even if you're not consciously aware of it i think if you're watching that film and you were just like fuck this guy is a snitch it would take so much of the tension out of the film yeah um and obviously you know it's just helped by lakeith stanfield who's so fucking good phenomenal actor. great um but yeah but i but i see what i i, I do see 
what the caller is saying. And I think that's why it's such an intense film to watch. And especially for those of us who, who don't have a lot of, uh, you know, demographics in common with those characters. I have no fucking idea what that would be like. And I, and I don't right. want to, I'm hesitant to judge. I'm, I'm hesitant to say, I know what I would do there. And that's what makes the whole thing so intense. <laughs> and that's what makes parts of that movie feel like you're just watching a lit fuse, get closer and closer yeah. to the bomb. And you're like, Oh shit, Oh shit, Oh shit. So yeah. It's one of the yeah. great tricks that movie plays that despite being based on a, a well-publicized historical event, it can still wring tension out of the, mm. the, the moments that only make it onto the screen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The last thing we're going to do is I'm just going to quickly give a little rapid fire from the email mailbag. Uh, remember, if you want to call us, you can call us at 1-213-534-8807 and you can weigh in on anything we're discussing here. Uh, or you can email us, movies at wisecrack.co. So rapid fire here. Brian says that we should cover Apocalypse Now at some point. Some point. I'm actually surprised that we have to to be honest. <laughs> I love uh, and I'm actually really surprised we have haven't done that. Um, Lucky requests that we never, ever, ever, ever use the word twee again, please, after a while listening to the Fantastic Mr. Fox uh, episode. Oh, I, requests, I was on that one. And requests that that word just be banished from the English lexicon. So, Fair. Lucky, uh, I think I think I can understand that. And then Alpan requests that we do Square, a Swedish film that I have never heard of but I figured Raymond might movie. know of it. Yeah, interesting movie. So here's yeah. all this to say. I think it's actually streaming you, on Hulu right now too. So we could we could very easily watch that one. All this to say, if you have film requests as well as uh, questions or comments, please get in touch with us. Either call us or you can email us. Not, all right, let's get out of here. But before we go, where can people find you on the internet, Michael? Michael O. Burns on the things. Sweet and Raymond. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd. I'm at Crematoria. Sweet. You can hit me up on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden, Insta, A-U-S underscore H-A-Y. I'm on TikTok now doing my damn thing. He's everywhere. Um, Austin, Austin dot Hayden. And uh, my YouTube channel is live and is hot and is popping. So you can just Google it. It's, it's good, Austin guys. On it's good. I like it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Send us out, Raymond. Goodbye from Nomadland, California. Shh.